For many years, Louis Buckhalter, known as Lepke, has been the worst industrial racketeer in America. His gangsters have sold protection to businessmen and others in the garment and baking industries. They've killed businessmen and others who opposed them. At last, two years ago, Lepke and 19 others were indicted. But Lepke is a fugitive. In the annals of American crime, the name Louis Lepke Buckelter looms ominously, for he not only rose from the gritty streets of New York City as a small-time thug, but ascended to become the enigmatic mastermind behind one of the most feared criminal enterprises of his time. His steely determination and ruthlessness garnered him a reputation as a true heavyweight in the underworld. However, his reign of terror came to a shocking end in 1944, when he became one of only two American mob bosses to face execution, meeting his fate in the electric chair. This event marked a pivotal moment in American criminal history, solidifying Buckleter's place as a notorious figure forever etched into the dark tapestry of organized crime. Louis Lepke Buckelter was born in New York City on February 6, 1897. He was the son of Russian immigrant Barnett Buckelter, who operated a hardware shop on the Lower East Side of New York City. His mother, Rose Buckelter, was refined and well-educated and his brothers went on to become a dentist, a rabbi, the third was a pharmacist, and his sister became a teacher. He attended public schools and, until his father's death in 1909, helped him with the day-to-day -day operations of the hardware store. From the age of 12 years old and soon after his father's death, Louis began associating with criminals. When he was 14 years old, his mother moved away and left him in the care of his sister, who rarely saw him. On September 2, 1915, Louis was arrested in New York for the first time for burglary and assault under the alias Louis Buckhouse, but the case was discharged. By 1916, Louis had moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut to work for an uncle. However, on February 29, 1916, he was arrested for the second time under the name Louis Carver. He started his sentence on May 18th at Cheshire Reformatory, but was paroled on July 12th. On July 23, 1916, he was supposed to report to his parole officer, but Louis was on his way back to New York. On September 28, 1917, in New York, Louis was sentenced to one and a half years at Sing Sing Prison on charges of grand larceny. On January 22, 1920, he returned to Sing Sing on a 30-month sentence for attempted burglary under the name Louis Cohen. After serving almost two years, he was paroled as a reformed prisoner on December 19, 1922. This marked the beginning of his lifelong criminal career and ultimately his demise. After his release, and while most notable underworld characters were attracted to the fast easy money available through bootlegging, Louis opted for a field with more permanence, labor racketeering. Louis and Jacob Gura Shapiro, whom he knew since his teenage days, linked up with Little Augie Orgen, the top labor racketeer of the period. The 1920s was also the time when criminal mastermind Arnold Rothstein took an active interest in the field. Rothstein provided financial aid and know-how for the two gangsters, who would later come to dominate this field. Little Augie focused on providing strike-breaking services to garment industry employers and unions, which Louis discovered was just the tip of the iceberg. Arnold Rothstein pushed Little Augie Origin to abandon union strong-arm tactics in favor of infiltrating their management, but he refused. On October 16, 1927, Louis, Shapiro, and other associates ambushed and executed Little Augie, believing he stood in their way. At the time, Jack Legg's diamond was his bodyguard and was also seriously wounded during the attack. On August 20th, 1931, Louis married Betty Wasserman, a British-born widow of Russian origin, and also adopted her child from a previous marriage. Louis and Shapiro began focusing on the union side of the business, eventually taking control of a number of locals, giving them significant leverage in blackmailing employers while raising and skimming membership dues. They infiltrated the Bakery Drivers Union. 
which, if the bakers wanted to ensure that their items arrived at the market fresh, they needed to pay a tax. This was followed by expansion into other businesses, frequently in collaboration with Tommy Lucchese, which inevitably led Louis Buckelter to Charles Lucky Luciano. With the levies collected, Louis Lepke Buckelter was making an estimated $10 million annually just for protection. After becoming a close associate of notable notorious figures such as Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, and Lucky Luciano, Louis Buckelter became part of the leadership that formed the new crime syndicate. In turn, Louis was chosen to run an enforcement arm within this setup, which later became known as Murder Incorporated. It is worth noting that while Louis Buckelter effectively performed contract killings for Cosa Nostra mobsters, the hit squad had no name until about 10 years later when the media dubbed it Murder Incorporated. Louis recruited the ruthless Shapiro and the much more murderous Albert Anastasia as his principal aides. His hit squad ultimately carried out hundreds of hits, and with money rolling in from his 250-man army of gunmen, Louis rose to millionaire status. His most significant murder came when the commission ordered the hit on Dutch Schultz. In the early 1930s, U.S. Attorney Thomas Dewey set out to indict the Dutchman for failure to pay federal taxes. Later, when Schultz had proposed the killing of Dewey to the commission, Luciano argued that a Dewey assassination would precipitate a massive law enforcement crackdown. After a unanimous decision was reached and opposed by the syndicate, Schultz walked out and said he would kill Dewey himself. Albert Anastasia later approached Luciano with information that Schultz had requested him to scout Dewey's Fifth Avenue apartment building. After hearing the news, the commission convened in private to discuss the situation. Following six hours of debate, the commission directed Louis Buckelter to get rid of the Dutchman. Schultz was shot in a Newark, New Jersey tavern on October 23, 1935, and died the next day from his injuries. Two of the three murder incorporated gunmen involved were Charles Workman and Emmanuel Weiss. In 1940, under pressure from Brooklyn authorities, Albert Tannenbaum, also a member of Murder Incorporated, turned state's witness. Reportedly, Tannenbaum told the grand jury that Workman had confessed to firing the fatal shots which killed the Dutchman and that he still had the pistol he used when he confided in Tannenbaum. Workman was already arrested in Brooklyn in 1940 and held as material witness for the contract killing of Joseph Rosen in a Brooklyn candy store on September 13, 1936. The murder of Joseph Rosen would have major consequences and Louis Lepke Buckelter's reign of terror would come to a shocking end. While Dewey focused on bakery extortion, the federal authorities pursued Louis for trade restraint. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics then uncovered evidence that Louis was the mastermind of a major narcotics smuggling scheme that included widespread bribery of U.S. Customs agents. After being arrested and out on bail, Louis went into hiding. With assistance from Albert Anastasia, he continued to have active control of his union rackets. The manhunt put tremendous strain on the entire syndicate, and in New York, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia added fuel to the fire by declaring a war on hoodlums. Luciano was arrested and confined to Danamora Prison, after which he decided that Louis had to surrender. With the help of Lungi's Woolman, the New Jersey crime boss, Luciano arranged for Mo Wolinski to deliver word to Louis that a deal had been struck with J. Edgar Hoover. Louis Buckelter surrendered to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover in front of a Manhattan hotel on August 24, 1939. Walter Winchell, a journalist and radio broadcaster, is said to have arranged the surrender agreement. This whole time, Louis was hiding in New York City. From the time Louis surrendered, he knew he had been double-crossed and that there was never any deal. Louis received 14 years on the narcotics charge and Thomas Dewey pinned a 39 years to life sentence on him. On May 9, 1941, Louis Buckelter was arraigned in New York State Court. Through the evidence offered by Abe Reles, Albert Tannenbaum, and others, Louis Buckelter was linked to the 1936 murder of Joe Rosen and three other murders. From behind bars, Louis allegedly ordered the murder of Wolinski and Abe Reles suffered a mysterious fall from a window in room 623 at the Half Moon Hotel. 
On December 2, 1941, Louis Buckelter was sentenced to death, and after numerous delays and legal moves on his part, he was executed in the electric chair in Sing Sing on March 4, 1944.